Hey everyone, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, hopefully a couple more people will be joining on. I know it's uh, getting into the lunch hour, so it's always a little bit tricky uh, with people hopping on. So, um, but we'll go ahead and get started. I'm gonna be turning it over to Laura Lander. Uh, we got a kind of an interactive panel discussion here today. Uh, so hopefully we'll have some good uh, discussion back and forth with everybody, um, but I will turn it over to Laura. Hey everyone. Uh, I'm Laura Lander. I'm social work faculty in the Department of Behavioral Medicine and Psychiatry. Um, and as you guys know, we're going to talk today about challenges related to medication for opioid use disorder in pregnant and postpartum individuals. Um, so we definitely, this is kind of a panel discussion. I have a couple of slides, but the, the goal is really to have a panel discussion. We have some cases from our own experience that we want to share um, that were challenges for us. Um, and then we really want to hear from other people about cases that have been challenges for them and either seek feedback from the panel members or just share with us like how you manage some, some of those challenges. So that would be great. Um, to start with, I'm just going to have our panelists introduce themselves. Uh, so Kelly, you want to introduce yourself? I'm Kelly Lemon. I'm a certified nurse midwife and women's health nurse practitioner, and I work here in Morgantown, West Virginia. Um, I work in the School of Nursing and in the School of Medicine, and one of the best parts of my job um, is helping with our pregnant, postpartum, and parenting um, coke group um, with Laura and with Candy, who are also uh, going to be in this discussion with us. Um, so I get to do the actual like prescribing for the individuals in our treatment program. Thank you. And Candy? Hi, I'm Candy Cooley. I am a peer recovery support specialist um, with the ACE program. Um, we work closely with women who are pregnant and postpartum, um, who um, some are going to the COAT program for um, their pregnancy group. And then we also ha have women who are going to other programs um, as well. Thanks, Candy. And then Angela, I don't know if you're able to turn on your camera and introduce yourself. Something's happening with your sound where it's all static. I don't know yeah. okay, what that means exactly. Uh, yeah, I, I muted you, Angela, if you're trying to talk to us, because it was pretty uh, getting a lot of feedback. Um, if you can use the chat, uh, let us know. Uh, you can introduce yourself. It sounded like you might be on the on the road, potentially. I'm not sure, though. OK, we may try and see if yeah, uh, it, it works in a little bit. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to share my screen, um, and this is just kind of supposed to set the, the the general framework of what we're hoping to talk with you guys about today. So as you know, there is some stigma um, and some misunderstanding around medications for opioid use disorders, especially in the pregnant and, and postpartum population. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and then really just want to share our experience and some of, of some of the challenges. Um, so women with substance use disorders um, have some particular uh, characteristics um, listed here. Um, they're, they're actually usually an over-responsible group uh, and also have high rates um, sexual and physical abuse as children and as an adult as adults. So um, rape uh, is fairly common, sexual assault. Uh, and also more likely to be incest survivors. So we know when we think about trauma, sexual trauma um, by a family member is uh, more traumatic than um, by uh, someone who's not a family. And certainly blood relative uh, really is very high on that, that threshold of, of traumatic events. Um, and women are often likely to use after a traumatic event. And so that's really what, why this is important to think about. It's connected to how they have managed their symptoms of trauma. And so when we ask people to uh, get sober um, and discontinue use, oftentimes this is a factor that makes it really difficult for people to maintain sobriety. 
Um, and when we think about pregnant women in general, I always like to remind people, I've, I believe that pregnant um, individuals are one of the most highly stigmatized uh, groups of, of people. And, and then you throw in seeking medication while you are pregnant, um, that actually adds an additional layer of stigma. So just in terms of what people are using, so pregnant women, um, the most common substances that pregnant women use are tobacco and marijuana. Um, and then you'll see alcohol is actually quite high. I, I feel like it's always important to remind people to screen for alcohol. Sometimes we just believe we've done a really good job with our uh, public health messaging that alcohol is not safe in pregnancy. Uh, but if somebody has an alcohol use disorder, that doesn't change uh, when you get pregnant. And so alcohol is still really important to screen for. Um, and then illicit drugs in general and opioids and cocaine are presented here. We're gonna talk mostly about opioid use disorder. So the treatment options during pregnancy are these. So there is, uh, it is possible to uh, detoxify in, um, in pregnancy. Uh, you can do so safely, but the main problem is that once people undergo uh, detox, this is whether you're pregnant or not, people get out of the hospital um, and have very high rates of relapse. So it's not actually the, the detox process that is the highest risk, although it certainly can present risks in pregnancy. It is what is, happens afterwards, which is um, very frequent um, overdose, uh, possibilities if someone's been detoxed and then had any period of abstinence and um, their their tolerance has gone down. So, so it actually increases the risk a lot. Residential treatment is always an option, outpatient therapy um, with or without uh, medication for opioid use disorder. So there are, there are these different kinds of medications. So methadone, suboxone, subutex, sublocade, um, and then um, there has been some initial research to show safety of naltrexone. Uh, so you guys probably know, I'm not gonna go into this a lot. So methadone is a full opioid agonist. Buprenorphine um, is um, a partial opioid agonist and the suboxone uh, is buprenorphine plus naloxone, which is the combination product, the naloxone being in there to uh, deter misuse. So snorting or injecting of the medication. And then there are several formulations of it. Sublocade is a newer medication that is a long acting injectable buprenorphine. This is currently being studied in pregnancy and early results show that it is certainly uh, looking really safe in pregnancy. So we have a, a couple of uh, NIDA like clinical trials um, in late stages that, that look um, good. And then uh, hopefully we may, we may have some choice about products, different kinds of products. But Sublocate is currently um, the only product FDA approved. And then naltrexone is a full um, antagonist. So when we think about benefits and risks, um, the benefits seem to weigh, outweigh the risks. Um, I'm not going to read these, but you can kind of see what they are. Um, and then we're going to talk about some of the risks uh, and complications. So one of those risks that people often think about, people in law enforcement think about this, people in child protective services think about it, as well as um, in treatment, so um, is diversion and misuse of medication. So typically there's not diversion or, or misuse of um, naltrexone uh, because it's a, a full opioid antagonist, uh, but the other medications can have a diverse and, and misuse potential. And this is based on some research by Lofall and Walsh. Uh, when they look at the top three reasons that people divert medication, it's, sometimes it's peer pressure. So we see this in um, uh, women and in couples sometimes. If, if, if it's the woman coming to treatment with a prescription, if she has a partner or another family member, sometimes pressures her to share medication with them. So that would be a reason. Uh, to help a family member so they feel bad for a family member and they don't want to see someone in, in withdrawal, that would be another reason that they would share medication or to sell the medication to make money. And the reasons for misuse, again, this is based on uh, research, is that when people have a history of using medications, IV or intranasally, 
sometimes it's hard to take things orally. They feel like it doesn't work as well. And so doing a lot of education around that, if someone is coming into treatment, it's really important and have a non-stigmatizing conversation around, you may be, you may have misused this medication or used this medication in this way previously. Uh, it's really important for us to know about that so we can help you use it safely. Um, and also if you do end up using it, uh, intravenously or snorting it, please just let us know because we want to help you um, use it orally because it's safer and it actually is more effective uh, when you do that versus um, other kinds of stigmatizing language that pe people may use in a conversation around those issues. Um, perceived over underdosing, so people just feel like they're not getting enough and they're still having withdrawal symptoms, so they take more than prescribed um, or to relieve withdrawal symptoms and cravings. Um, intoxication is definitely in there as, as a reason, although most people need to be opioid naive to really get intoxicated from a medication like buprenorphine, um, and then to self-medicate mental health symptoms or pain, uh, self-medicate for pain. And the prevalence, which uh, is often surprising pe for people, so when you look at um, the most common reasons for misuse among individuals with opioid use disorder, really 9% of people are using for intoxication. There are all these other reasons that people are using. Um, Self-medication, managing moods, uh, managing physical pain, um, and, and withdrawal cravings uh, are, are really the top of the list. So again, I think this is important when we in, to inform our conversations with women because one of the main reasons why people believe maybe you should not take uh, medications for opioid use disorder um, are around mis misuse and diversion. There are also some indications which we can certainly talk more about. So the buprenorphine itself is under study for the treatment of stimulant use disorder, but there's not really enough evidence so that to make it FDA, appro FDA approved for that. Um, so it's really for opioid use disorder. Uh, it can be in combination with stimulant use disorder, but the person should have a, an opioid use disorder as well. Um, if people can't keep their medications safe, that is certainly a factor. Either it's lost, stolen, or um, it, it can be a risk for being ingested by children or animals. Uh, we don't want to put other people uh, at risk for safety reasons. And then the inability to take medication is prescribed. But I, I would suggest that, that we work with patients for a period of time before we make that determination. We don't know that just because patients have a history of IV use or intranasal use. Uh, that's not in and of itself a reason not to prescribe medication. And then there are various medical contraindications, which I will let... Um, Kelly talk about if that comes up in, in our talk today. And I just want to remind people, this is a wonderful resource, this clinical guide um, to treating pregnant and parenting women with opioid use disorder, and you can get it free on the SAMHSA website. Uh, many of many questions uh, are answered in this guide, and um, it's a very useful guide. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, so Angela, did you figure out if you can introduce yourself yet? We see that you're unmuted, but we don't hear you, unfortunately. Okay. Um, so just, um, I'm always happy to hear from people. Do, do Does anyone who's on today have a particular case that they wanted to talk about that they're struggling with in terms of um, medication for opioid use disorder, and is this a person good, good, good candidate, or or are they seeming to struggle with the medication itself, or uh, keeping things safe, whatever the case may be? Any anyone have a a case they wanted to talk about? If not, we have some of our own to to launch us. We can start with the one, um, Jay, I think I sent you one. It's 
so the the case that that I had um, is kind of a very common clinical picture at this point. Uh, so this is a young woman who came to us who um, identified as having an opioid use disorder, but primarily she was struggling with methamphetamines. So 34 year old female, um, this is her third child and she, the, her other children did not live with her. So she was, um, she, she basically came to us as at the recommendation of her uh, nurse midwife. So she came into treatment and um, what was there? A, let, can we go to the, the case presentation first? Okay, thank you. Um, when she came for it was an outpatient intake assessment. She had zero days of sobriety. So she admitted that she had used methamphetamines the day before and she was also taking Suboxone off the street. Um, she had been using substances a very long time since she was about 14 years old. Um, first first sub substance she used was marijuana. And uh, you know, she this, this is fairly common that um, she actually switched addictions. Her primary substances of choice used to be uh, opioids and benzodiazepines. And she had a period of sobriety following a 90-day rehab um, approximately six years ago. And then she relapsed and her primary struggle that she was having was with methamphetamines. And then she came into us both taking buprenorphine off the street and um, struggling with methamphetamines in her second trimester. And it was really her pregnancy that brought her into treatment. She basically said, if I wasn't pregnant, I wouldn't be here, which was super honest. She's a very honest person, uh, which, we, which we love about her. So she had some comorbidities, some medical comorbidities, high blood pressure, gallbladder problems, dental problems, and a mental health uh, comorbidity of anxiety. And uh, upon you know the first intake, her oops, I spelled methamphetamines wrong. Uh, her urine was positive for methamphetamines and buprenorphine, and she was taking buprenorphine off the street. So one of the things that sometimes comes up is, oh, well, this person's main issue is methamphetamines. What are we doing with buprenorphine? Um, she was taking buprenorphine off the street, so she did have. Uh, tolerance to um, opioids, and had we not prescribed her buprenorphine, she would have experienced withdrawal. So we kept her on on buprenorphine uh, and took her into our pregnancy code clinic. Um, we struggled because she continued to use methamphetamines during the entire course of her pregnancy. Uh, we did recommend residential treatment to her. She went in for detox, stayed very briefly, did not follow through with residential treatment following that, came out and continued to use methamphetamines. And so retention becomes a concern. You know, do we retain her in treatment even though she is not following the guidance, which would be to discontinue use of methamphetamines or go to a higher level of care? She uh, eventually developed severe preeclampsia. And Kelly, I don't know if you want to chime in a little bit on the course of uh, that medical issue. Yeah. So the, the thing that really confounded her entire situation was when she was in these periods of not using methamphetamines, clinically very normal individual. Um, and then when she would use methamphetamines, her blood pressure would spike and her liver enzymes would increase, which you would expect with someone who's used a stimulant. Um, the kind of problem that we ran into with her was if you are pregnant and your blood pressure spikes and your liver enzymes rise, the assumption is that you're preeclamptic. Um, so when we would, and we have this interesting scenario where we would get her into um, treatment and into detox and everything would normalize. And then she would come out and she would use again and everything would become abnormal. Um, where we actually had her in the hospital admitted, um, she was under 34 weeks. So they were just trying to essentially monitor her and, and get her to where she reached the point of being 34 weeks and stable for delivery. And when she was stable in the hospital, all of her liver enzymes would improve and her blood pressure was normal without treatment. 
And then if she left the hospital, there were two cases where she left AMA and she did use, um, and she would come back into care and clinically she would present as a severe preeclamptic again. Um, so it, it, it muddied the waters a little bit where we were trying to do the best by her from an obstetric standpoint, but unfortunately there is no data that shows you exactly what happens to somebody in pregnancy when they use methamphetamines versus not using um, because they clinically present as a severe preeclamptic and get managed and delivered as a severe preeclamptic. And then after that phase, people aren't trending lab work and trending blood pressures as much once they're postpartum and discharged. So it made it interesting. Um, thanks, Jay. We can stop sharing. So I'm, I'm curious um, if there's any other way that any folks in the group, um, the treatment programs you guys are affiliated with, if it would have been handled differently or any thoughts about um, what we ended up doing with this with patient. And I guess it's helpful to say that ultimately she ended up delivered. Um, in the postpartum phase, we were able to transition her into, I think she went all through it. She was 28 days, right, Laura? Yeah, yeah she went yeah. through a full 28 day program um, and has done really well since the 28 day program. What we advocated for um, fiercely when she was admitted and stable um, was to transition her to a 28 day program during the pregnancy um, with really close monitoring. Um, and that unfortunately is not what we were and ended up able to do. Um, yeah. yeah. So you guys are probably seeing a lot of the same that we are, which is yes. um, <laughs> they're already coming in on buprenorphine, most of our patients, and they're struggling with the others. So I don't think you know, like, like you said, Laura and um, Katie or Kelly, sorry, um, we would have definitely kept her on the buprenorphine because even though right now she was self-treating, so I don't think, you know, that would have been inappropriate at all. Um, and methamphetamine is a struggle. I think it's really, by using the buprenorphine, it keeps them in treatment. And I think it helps over the long run to keep them connected. Um, so I think that would be helpful. The, the one element that I don't think we have a lot of, which I think would help some of these patients would be kind of a a housing village setting where they could, you know, it's not necessarily an inpatient setting. Um, but I think that's just kind of my, I haven't seen that a lot around here, but it would be very helpful because it gets them out of that environment without necessarily being inpatient because they need, they don't need 28 days. They need a year of longer treatment um, outside in the world. It's not, you know, and so it, I think they can get better. And then we just don't have very great medications for methamphetamine. We can try, but in pregnancy, there's also the challenge of, you know, how many medicines do you want to use that don't have great evidence, even though in other situations I may use them, but in pregnancy, it's a little tougher. And, and I think you're right, Kelly, the, the um, preeclampsia is it really preeclampsia or is it methamphetamine it's probably methamphetamine it's my my guess um when you look at it and, yeah and we, we had a debate back and forth with our ob uh providers and our our uh, behavioral medicine providers and ultimately the risk was both sides ultimately said the risk is too great uh, to take her into the residential setting because we may not be able to manage it well uh, but Kelly and I mm. both believe that that would have been the best thing. Great. And I think Why were too, they this... afraid? Oh, no, go ahead. Why were they afraid of going to the residential setting with her? That she would ultimately be a, truly be a preeclamptic, have an eclamptic seizure, and that her and her baby would have a negative outcome. That was the fear. So despite, some, some, despite some evidence to suggest otherwise, but yeah. But I do think a lot of people and Kelly probably, you know, once they reach a certain point, you're better delivering her at, you know, sooner than later. Cause even with her addiction, she's at risk of, of dying or having bad outcomes regardless of the preeclampsia. So I've always felt that, you know, for, you know, after a certain point, maybe 37 weeks, only bad things can happen. And so it's probably worth delivering her at that point and, and continuing right. her treatment. Yeah, the tough thing that I had with this poor person was she was so highly motivated. Um, and really the only reason that she left her only did like a shorter treatment in that first round that she went where she only went for seven days was 
this overwhelming need to like prepare things for the baby. Um, and that's what I find like drives people out of like doing like a longer treatment all the time is like needing to like, I need to have my house set up and I need to have the baby supplies and I need to get a job and I need to work as much as I can at the job. Like, even though we'll, we'll come in and wrap around and be like, we have all the things that we can hook you up. Like we can get you to the people they need. Um, there's also this level of like, I don't want to be reliant on others. And like, I should be able to get this together for my baby, which I find very, very hard for people and very fascinating. Um, this like level of like independence and wanting to, to do this for their baby. Which is where they need the like little village. I wish I could just buy like a little like community and be like, here's everyone's town home. <laughs> here's the community food pantry. Here's the community <laughs> baby pantry. I'm wondering too, if anyone else has this experience as well. Um, that's something that I recurrently see is this general misconception that, that buprenorphine is the cure-all for everything. So I think that's what, from like a watching the providers interact with her and watching nursing staff, this misconception that since she was in a treatment program and since she was on buprenorphine, that that means she should never ever have any other cravings and use anything else and not understanding what what buprenorphine is used for. I'm wondering if that's something that everyone else sees. Yeah, I mean, and I feel like Kelly that that's kind of increased only um, starting with the pandemic um, because of a lot of the laxity on um, any of the behavioral health interventions and just relying on medication and then kind of hearing that as the gold standard from the Biden administration and SAMHSA, it does give people the impression that the medication should be taking care of this incredibly complex condition that has like behavioral, psychological, spiritual components. Um, so yeah, we, we do have that. And, and I also think it's, it's harmful for our health system in that it kind of professionals can put people in boxes of like, oh, you're one of the good ones because you responded well to treatment. And so we don't have any um, positive test results from you. Um, and you're one of the bad ones because even though you did the same treatment, but you didn't respond as, as robustly. Um, and that's very frustrating. So I really don't feel like as medical providers, we should be um, telling people who deserves, you know, to be treated with dignity and respect or who deserves uh, a chance to be reunified with their child. Yeah, and it's interesting, Kelly, you brought that up because I don't always think about that, but, you know, they think they're in treatment, they're fine, but also the patients also have a perception that buprenorphine is a cure-all. <clears throat> so we have one patient that we took into the program because she didn't ever have a history of an opioid use disorder, but she'd created her own by um, using buprenorphine to get off of alcohol. Mm -hmm. So now she was dependent on the buprenorphine had a significant alcohol use disorder, but had treated it completely by herself by taking buprenorphine, which there may be a little bit of data now, but you know, it's still, it's not, but that was her whole impression is that, you know, and so then you're stuck with this um, treatment plan, but she did really well. She wasn't drinking and she's now, you know, weaning off the buprenorphine, but it's, it's going to be three years now. So that she really does have a a buprenorphine use disorder, which she was buying off the streets. Um, and then, you know, I've even had a patient and we see this in our clinicians, another one that has a chronic um, pain issue from having an osteosarcoma had been on oxycodone and you know, some other pain medicine and was told by um, an OB that she needed to be on buprenorphine where it would have been totally appropriate just to continue her pain medication without any difference. And so the difference is now that I have her on buprenorphine, um, she had gotten switched over to buprenorphine. She's actually on higher doses because the buprenorphine stronger. Um, the good side is her pain is well controlled, but she really never had an opiate use disorder at all. But because of the regulations and systems, we had her in our group and she benefited a lot in terms of learning about stigma and contributing to the group and wanted to stay in it. Um, but we've since moved her out because there's only, you know, there's only so much growth you can do 
in an addiction group when you don't have an addiction, you can understand that and stuff. So she stayed with us probably nine months and now I'm treating her individually, but it's really, she's now on buprenorphine for pain, not for addiction. And it's working very well for her, but um, probably walking a fine line on regulation there. I'm honestly, you know, um, so. Yeah, I'll never, I will, and it's something that I, it always reminds me that I need to be more mindful of when I meet with people and when we're starting them on it is I will never um, forget walking around, like it was when Dr. Marshallik was still our primary prescriber for our group, um, just being in clinic and just walking laps with an individual who was just needed to pee for her screen and was so scared to pee and was like, I, I, I'm, I'll admit I used marijuana. Like I, I'm so upset. Like, I don't, I know that you guys know, and like <laughs> all I need to do is pee, but I can't. And just talking with her and, and having her be so hard on herself for using uh, marijuana consistently and being like, I don't understand why I'm doing this. I'm going to, I'm on this medicine. I shouldn't be craving that and, and having to like break it down for her that this is for opiates. This doesn't help with marijuana cravings. And even, even she who'd been in treatment for two years at that point, like stopped and was like, you mean this doesn't do anything for marijuana? And I was like, no, coming to treatment, like will help with that, but this, this isn't helping that. So don't be so hard on yourself. And she, she was just like, my mind's blown. I didn't, I didn't know, <laughs> like maybe you guys told me, but I just don't, I didn't realize um, so, I mean, even among the, the people who are on treatment, like sometimes there is that misconception. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Candy, I don't know if you have any challenges you can think of with um, folks you've worked with over, over the years related to medication for opioid use disorder. Well, there's tons. <laughs> um, family is a huge one um, just because the stigma with medication isn't isn't just um you know like in the general public but it hits home for a lot of our women um you know they're they're dealing with um you know a lot of times family um, that don't necessarily approve of medication or maybe not know uh, the full scope of their addiction. Um, so we have a lot of women who don't even tell their partner or their um, family that they are on medication. So when they do go in to deliver, that creates a challenge. Um, and a lot of women are afraid that, um, you know, a nurse might walk in and say, you know, oh, it's time for your time for your Suboxone. And, you know, they have their partner there who doesn't know they're on Suboxone or their, um, you know, parents who doesn't know that they're on Suboxone. Um, so a lot of times we have people who are really afraid of that and they, you know, want their family support because they're going into labor and, you know, it's their pregnancy and they need that family support and they you know and they want that but at the same time there's almost like this other side that they don't feel comfortable sharing that uh with family members or um you know other people i feel like it's worse for women who are pregnant because there's been because there's so much information about um infants who are going through withdrawal that people automatically think that it's you know a really bad thing that women are on um, a type of medication and so we you know I, I know I have to talk to women a lot about um, you know what they can do to um, help the infants you know whenever they're born to um, manage the symptoms of withdrawal um, if they even have them, you know, because it's not a guarantee that they're going to have them. Um, but, you know, also letting them know that it's better for them to be on medication um, than for them to just abruptly stop. And like Laura said, like the risk of them going back out and using is so high, you know. So, yeah, I feel like we have. With women who are pregnant, um, when you said you feel like they're the most stigmatized, I, 
I've said that since I started this job. I mean, I thought, you know, being someone who's in recovery, I've seen, you know, I've, I've seen stigma and I've seen, um, you know, I know what it feels like, but I don't, I can't say that I know for sure what it feels like to be pregnant and to be stigmatized like that. And I've, I've been with women and I've seen it and it's, it's like a, a different level. It's a completely different level than what I've ever dealt with being somebody in recovery. Um, so well, I, even just the recovery, it's, we just experienced this in treatment team a few weeks ago, where even within individuals in recovery, like being like, well, I might use, but I've never used while I'm pregnant and like making that distinction. Um, well, when I first started, that was the, that was like the big thing. So th this is like what changed my mind completely was we, this is when we were in person, uh, we were in coat group um, and a lady had, um, you know, talked about her having a slip up um, and was very honest about it. And, you know, it's like everybody in the treatment team was, was very encouraging. And she, you know, I think that she felt good about it, you know, and we were walking out and I was walking with another lady who was pregnant and she started talking about this woman saying, I can't believe that she used while she's pregnant and just, you know, was like really hard. And I, you know, that was like the first time that I had thought about like, other women who are pregnant, like just really being down on somebody else. And so I, I had to look at her. I didn't, you know, I didn't get into recovery until my son was 19. So I looked at her and I said, sometimes it happens when we're pregnant. Sometimes it happens when they, you know, when someone sees the baby for the first time. And I said, sometimes it doesn't happen till the kid is 19. And she kind of like you know she got it and she was like you know I didn't think about that she's like I just thought like I'm pregnant I was able to stop and you know that everybody else should and and it was it was good because we had a big conversation about this but I hadn't really thought about you know how stigmatized pregnant women are until until then you know it, it's very eye-opening do you think sometimes um, that there's actually more stigma being in treatment and pregnant than just using and not being in treatment? <laughs> I mean, you know, I, it's like, you know, if you could get that well, like I have a lot of families giving patients, oh, you're still on that buprenorphine, <laughs> you know, you should be over that versus when they were using, they were just using. <laughs> oh, I think because like people hide their use and so whenever they're in treatment, it's um, people don't look at it as, oh, I'm going into treatment for treatment to get better. They're just looking at it as, oh, I'm in a drug treatment. And, and I don't think they look at it as anything, you know, them improving and, you know, getting their lives back. They just, they just kind of label it as like, oh, you're in, you're in drug treatment. And um when somebody's using, they you know, typically hide their use. And I don't think the families a lot of time know the extent of their using. So in, in those cases, I don't think that people realize like how much better it is for them to be in treatment as opposed to them using. Yeah, I, I think, Candy, you're absolutely right that the family's benchmark for how easy it should be for them to just get off of it has to do with the fact that the person has gone through a lot of efforts to conceal how much they're using and if, if they're still using. And then when it when the person or their spouse becomes aware, no, this is a serious enough issue, this person needs to be medicated during their pregnancy, I think probably part of what they're reacting to is the fact that they didn't realize how serious it was. So they get up that upset. Yeah, I, I, yeah, you're right. I just spoke to um, a boyfriend of, of someone who was going into treatment and she, he just did not understand 
why she's going into treatment because last year she had went to detox um and you know he thought that was just supposed to fix everything you know she shouldn't have to go into treatment and she shouldn't have to be on medication and um you know I, 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 we we talked for a good while and i think that his mind kind of changed and he was you know because i explained to this is a lifelong thing it's not not a quick fix and um i think that he was you know his mind kind of opened up a little bit um you know and there's a lot of resources for families as well like al on and nar and on and things like that so um yeah but i still think we have a long way to go with with stigma and especially with for pregnant women I think also just what I've noticed with my patients, it's like with stigma, the call is coming from inside the house too. Like moms are, we're already hard on ourselves for a number of reasons. And so um, they feel guilty that they used, they feel guilty that they're sober. They feel guilty. They did, you know, they didn't stop at three months. They stopped at six months or whatever it is. Like they're going to feel guilty about it. Um, so, and, and also, I think the fact that we do know some about NAS, but we don't we don't know enough about the long term effects. And so moms are often hyper vigilant of any difference that they're seeing in their child. Oh, that's because I used. That's because I was on Suboxone. That's because of this. Um, so does anyone else have? Um examples of struggles that you've seen patients go through related to medication for opioid use disorder or challenges? So I, I'd like to share a situation if folks don't mind, because um, it's just on the top of my mind right now. And, and I'm wanting to make sure we're not, where there's no stone uncovered as far as things we could be doing to help this woman. So. Um, this patient has three um, children previous to moving to West Virginia that um, were all terminated. Uh, her parental rights were terminated rather um, really successively. So they were um, two separate cases, but they were really one was building on the other one. Um, from what we know, and it seems very credible because of the way the court in West Virginia is proceeding, the first um, child that was born, she was born in a state where um, they assign felony penalties to a child being born prenatally exposed to substances. She was self-medicating with Suboxone and, um, but did not, was not in a program. And I don't know that this particular state really makes a distinction of your, if you're in a program or not, um, but the, um, the reason for her charges, it was a like felony battery, creating injury or something like that, um, or child, child abuse, battery, creating injury, uh, because of the number of days that the baby was treated in the hospital for NAS. Um, and then her two other children were born during a period where she was really trying to comply with CPS, but um, it, it was just a very hostile and things were not working out for her. So. She became pregnant and left that state, which I would have done the same thing. Um, but she's in West Virginia, gave birth in a different county from Cabell. Um, and it's a county that has a drug, a family drug treatment court. So it's not um, one of the ones that I feel like has been extremely hard to reach. They, they know some people that are doing well in recovery, um, but it's not Cabell. So these, it's not, not folks that are accustomed to seeing um, the amount of prenatal substance exposure and people that are on MOUD like while during pregnancy. Um, and it was very heartbreaking because um, the whole time I've known mom, she's been sober and highly motivated. Um, she was able to actually bring the baby home with her from Lily's place to Project Hope and was wonderful with her, um, very sweet and loving. And um, 
her, so she had her preliminary hearing. Um, after that, she had what treatment team believes to be a false positive um, because she tested positive for pretty low levels of um, morphine and codeine, but not the like six MAM, that's like the marker for heroin and no adulterants, which in Huntington would be really weird. If you were using heroin in Huntington, there would be all kinds of other stuff in there like fentanyl and gabapentin and all kinds of stuff. Um, so we felt it was credible that it was poppy seeds. Um, and uh, doc, you know, Dr. Hansen and I were in agreement, the toxicology, the um, someone over the lab wrote a report in that effect. Um, CPS still chose to do an emergency removal. Um, and so the baby had um, went into foster care for the first for first 30 days rather than um, rather than granting an improvement period. She was just uh, adjudicated abuse of a neglectful parent because of um, the presence of Suboxone in her system at this delivery, maybe four. Um, there was a continuance, so we just went back for court. Uh, this was the hearing that she could have been granted an improvement period. It was denied and um, disposition is set for 45 days from now. And the guardian ad litem, the baby's lawyer, is actually very enthusiastic about reunification, actually wanted to send the baby back to Project Hope at the last hearing. Um, so essentially, the judge is wanting to see her maintain compliance for another 45 days and then would consider a post-disposition improvement period with movement toward reunification. So at this point, the guardian ad litem, um, you know, believes this is in the best interest of the child. Um, it seems like the judge is kind of open-minded. She's compliant with treatment and, and doing everything that she needs to do for us. But I just wanted to kind of put that out there. Like, is, is there anything that people think we could um, do to, I don't know, to advocate for her in some way. What we've done so far is just um, the medical opinions about that um, screen. Um, and then I was available for court last week. They didn't, even, they didn't have me testify, but I went up there. Um, so I don't know if anyone has, has had any success um, with just reaching out directly to CPS or anything like that in a situation where Truly, I mean, I, it's a legal decision. It's really not my decision at all. But like, I, I, I get how they can say she was at risk of harm, but it's kind of hard to uh, operationalize that based on what I saw. So, um, I don't know. Any thoughts? It's just an unusual case for me because it seems what's being held against her is um, something that would not be illegal in West Virginia, which is to uh, be on a, uh, any illicit substance, but particularly to be on Suboxone during pregnancy. I'll just say good for her for sticking with, yeah. with <laughs> treatment and because, you know, dealing with that, like I always say, like once. Uh, if we have somebody who's doing really well and then CPS steps in, it, it's normal f to see them go downhill and, um, you know, it takes a little bit more time for them to pick themselves back up. But, you know, for her to stay engaged is, is awesome. So. Yeah, it, that's, it seems that that's what won the GAL over because she was kind of expecting that when she was told she couldn't have the baby back the first time that she was going to leave treatment. Um, I mean, I would hope that her lawyer is, is pulling like, and using like specific examples of like in this state, like this is what the, the legal consequences compared to this state. So I would assume that somebody, I would hope somebody's already like on and covering that. I guess for me, like all, from my perspective, what we can do is just like consistently like provide like letters of documentation of like good standing.
is she on any other um, medications for like blood pressure control or um, thyroid disorder? I believe um, she's on, um, I wanna say something like Zoloft and Visteril. I do think she's on a blood pressure pill, mm -hmm. but I don't We've know what seen I've seen a lot of, um, like, so most frequently in pregnancy, they'll get put on lobetalol, and lobetalol will cause a lot of false positives on a point of care test mm -hmm. um, with either fentanyl or opiates. Okay. Synthroid, we frequently see cause false positives. Um, and when you look at confirmations, confirmations will come out negative. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously, if they've run a confirmation and it's still positive, then you can you can rule out those. But if these are screens that they're not running confirmations on, then that could also be a, a consideration. We've seen that a lot. Mm -hmm. With those cases, um, what kind of documentation do you provide if the patient says, well, their, you know, their treatment team has verbally acknowledged to them, this is what we think it is, but then on, you know, the paper, they have their printout that they're taking to court or to their work or what would you do for them? Yeah. So it just depends. Like, so for example, I've had one who, um, was testing positive with CPS for fentanyl and then would have negative confirmations for us and she was on labetalol. So I would just like consistently put letters like anytime I had a positive for me that was like flagged, like the point of care test was positive for fentanyl or like the, the specimen without confirmation was positive. I would immediately, as soon as I got that confirmation that was negative, drop that in and put, we have evidence to support that. Like this confirmation is negative um, we have evidence to support that there'll be a false positive with beta wall screens. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll usually just like go through and put like any kind, like I'll cite an article and I'll put like a direct like clip of like, this is her lab result, this is her lab result. I've done that in the past. Yeah, we had to pull a lot of articles for reference ranges for this particular one. Because I've seen that happen too with, um, when people get like pain medicine in labor, if the cord specimen's positive, I've had two that have had that happen where I've had to like go through and like fiercely document. That's a tough one. I don't think you're leaving a stone unturned. I think you guys are doing everything that that's in your power and it feels really powerless and awful. <laughs> Yes, I know. Oh, I don't know. It does. I think that's that's a good thing to validate for folks on the call. Like sometimes you do feel really powerless. Any other comments or questions? We got about four minutes left. All right, hearing none, we will then go ahead and adjourn. Thank you to all the panelists and uh, the comments back and forth from, I know Dr. Baltier, I have to, had to hop, hop off early, but appreciate everybody uh, chiming in. And our next session will be on uh, Monday, May 8th. So be on the lookout for the reminders for that. Um, and the recap from this uh, session will come out uh, later today. All right, thanks everybody.